but the classical picture of light still manifests itself even when dealing with just one single photon at a time, which was puzzling to physicists. So they decided to make an observation. In these types of experiments, observation is done by a detector, usually in the form of a photomultiplier tube, not a human being. A photomultiplier is a class of vacuum tube that is made to detect very low intensity ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum. The photodetector must interact with the photon in order to know the slit through which it went. The first stage of the interaction is when the photon collides with the photocathode material. Through the photoelectric effect, this collision produces electrons that are then multiplied by a process known as secondary electron emission. During the process of secondary emission, electrons are sent to an electrode called a dynode, where they collide to create new electrons. This process iterates itself and builds up until the last dynode is reached, at which a very powerful pulse of electric current is generated signaling the arrival of the first photon. Where in this explanation did I need to invoke the idea that the consciousness of a living organism changes the photon? Nowhere, because I didn't have to. The conclusion was drawn that the very act of observing caused a wave function to collapse and create the existence of matter, either in the state of particles or as a wave. According to the Schrodinger equation, independent of observation, particles exist in a state of a wave function, which is a series of potentialities rather than actual objects. The very act of observing causes wave of potentialities to collapse to a state of matter. I don't like IP's phrasing of what the wave function actually is. The wave function does not have a physical reality. It's just a mathematical model that describes the expectation values of particular observables of a quantum particle or system. The act of observing does not change the particle. The act of observing allows for greater precision as to the actual state of the particle, but it is not as if the particle didn't have any properties prior to measurement. It just means that you must perturb the particle in some fashion, as I have just described, in order to know its actual properties rather than what is described by the wave function. State of matter. The results inferred was that matter didn't exist independent of observation or measurement, flipping materialism up on its head. You, sir, are an idiot. To better explain this, in the Quantum Enigma, Rosenblum and Kuttner explain with a simple scenario, representing what is actually happening. If you were to take an electron and isolate it in a superposition of two boxes, and open one box, the electron will collapse into either one or the other box. So if you don't see it in one, it will definitely exist in the other. However, if you were to take another pair of boxes and open both simultaneously, the electron will come out of both as a spread out wave. It would display the wave of potentialities as an actual spread out wave. The key to understanding what is happening is that matter doesn't exist as a wave of energy prior to observation, but as a wave of potentialities prior to observation. The waviness in a region is the probability of finding the object in a particular place. We must be careful. The waviness is not the probability of the object being in a particular place. There is a crucial difference here. The object was not there before you found it there. These were the conclusions drawn from the Schrodinger equation and the experimental results at the time. It wasn't there before you found it there because you perturbed the system to make a measurement. And the Schrodinger equation has no philosophical implication. It was only reconfirmed in the 1960s by Klaus Jonsson. At that time though, not everyone liked the conclusion that was playing out. Some like Einstein and Schrodinger were deeply troubled by the results of quantum mechanics. So in 1935, Einstein and two of his colleagues proposed a thought experiment to debunk quantum mechanics. They proposed that if you placed two particles in a joint superposition and then separated them by a great distance, an observation of one would instantly affect the other, which Einstein called a spooky action at a distance. The point was the observation of one couldn't affect the other instantly, because information couldn't travel faster than the speed of light. If it did, then relativity would be violated, which didn't seem possible at the time. So instead, there must be some physical, undiscovered, local, hidden variable that was actually affecting them instead of our observation, that matter acted independent of observation and only appeared to be observer-dependent from our perspective. However, in the 1960s, John Bell began to explore this thought experiment and propose an inequality. If this inequality was shown to be false, then the local hidden variable theories would be debunked and matter would be dependent on observation. This was put to experimental test in 1982 by the physicist Alan Aspect, and the results confirmed Bell's prediction. 
Bell's inequality was violated. Einstein's spooky action at a distance was real. This confirmed what quantum mechanics was telling us. Prior to measurement, objects have no defined properties or location. The act of a conscious observer creates the existence of the physical objects and the properties they entail. John, I just want to correct Lawrence an Cross error that, I mean, I'm, I don't think you meant it, Ian, so I want to just make it clear. The laws of physics are deterministic. The Schrodinger equation, which is the basis of quantum mechanics, is a second-order differential equation. And therefore, the laws are deterministic. Our observations aren't deterministic, but the underlying laws are deterministic. Nothing's changed in, in, in 400 years. And so it's really well, important to recognize there's no way... Isn't the, the universe isn't, dis isn't deterministic. Wait a minute. Uh, I, it's governed I, by quantum mechanics. Just one thing, um, because we got into four syllables and I'm not that smart. Um, <laughs> Just give us a working definition yeah. of the word deterministic. You, you, you mean... You, you it, start it, with an initial it, condition for the equations of quantum mechanics, and the, and the evolution of the system is determined unambiguously. It has to no happen. no uncertainty. Your measurement of the system has uncertainty, but the evolution of the underlying uh, system know, is completely I'll, determined. I'll, I'll Krauss is right. You see, in 1913, Niels Bohr introduced his idea of the Bohr model of the atom, in which he referred to electrons as circling the nucleus of the atom in what is called a stationary state. And while he turned out to be wrong in this formulation of the mechanics and dynamics of what goes on in the atom, he got the concept of a stationary state right. In quantum mechanics, stationary states are states for which the probabilities of outcomes are the same regardless of when the measurement is made. The particle had properties independent of a mind if IP wants to use that word, or rather, before measurement. It's just that the measurement introduced external factors that affected the time evolution of the system. If what IP was saying were true, then it would be mathematically impossible to solve for the eigenstates of the observables in a quantum mechanical system. Instantly. Who deserves to trust their intuition more than Einstein? And Einstein's intuition told him, like everybody's intuition tells them, that things are really there when you're not looking at them. Well, he was wrong, right? <laughs> you know, that, that intuition is incorrect. And now for a proper explanation by Dr. Victor Stanger on For Good Reason. So in, in physics, there's this notion of wave-particle duality, and that notion in quantum spirituality, call it, becomes somehow proof that we make our own reality, that the way we look at things determines what we're looking at, right? Yes, that was a gross misunderstanding of quantum mechanics that goes back to some of the things that Niels Bohr had talked about in the 30s. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, he and some of the other physicists who were philosophizing about it were, were kind of careless with their language, which is a bad thing to be when you're philosophizing. The last thing you want to do is... Yeah, that's my philosophers. And in a way, I kind of admire them because they are so such sticklers on them, on making sure they define every word that they use. Well, physicists don't, are not used to doing that, and so it, it got kind of out of hand. Deepak Chopra and also Fritjof Capra, the Tao of Physics. On one level, all this stuff basically says something kind of sensible, that physics shows us that literally everything is interconnected. Um, I mentioned the hot dog vendor spirituality, you know, make me one with everything. But uh, isn't it actually true that everything is connected? So they do have a point there, right? Yes, but uh, here's the difference. Let, let me give some examples of, of how, the, how this works. Say, say when, when your car, uh, the oil pump in your car breaks down. So what do you do? You replace the oil pump. You don't also change the tires and get new brakes and so on. And uh, that's, that's what's called a reductionist view of things, where you everything is broken down into parts, and you can handle the parts individually. In medical science, it's the same way. They, you know, they, they like to pay a lot of lip service to treating the whole patient and so on, but they don't. I mean, the doctor goes in there, and if you have a kidney problem, he fixes your kidneys and so on. And, and then what happened, interestingly enough, with, with Capra, is Capra had been involved in, in experiments that were, uh, in a theory, actually, theoretical work in Berkeley uh, that was uh, that seemed to confirm the, the ideas that he, he was writing about in the book. 
But the very year that he published the book, 1975, was the year that uh, those those ideas were rebutted. What were the ideas exactly? I mean, so his claim was that on the yeah, quantum level... He was working level... at Berkeley, at the, the, the physics department, with a very prominent professor named Jeffrey Chu, who had this idea uh, that uh, you couldn't break matter down into elementary particles, but that you had to treat all the particles the same way. He called it nuclear democracy. And I remember that very well, because that was at about the time I was, I, I just started work, uh, doing my research. And I was working in that area uh, myself, so I was very familiar with it. And then what happened at the very year that uh, Capper wrote this book, which he made a big point of this research, it was also called S-Matrix Theory, I think, in the book. You'll see it referred to that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the new uh, standard model of particles came along, which showed once again that everything... <laughs> breaks down very nicely into individual parts. That was when the quarks were discovered and, 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 and was realized that, uh, that nuclei and uh, neutrons and protons were not elementary, but they were made up of more fundamental objects. And now we've had, for 30 years now, we've had this, this totally reductionist theory of matter called the standard model that has been consistent with every observation that anybody has made in, in any field of, of, of science. Uh, there's nothing that, that anybody has done that uh, shows any inconsistency with, with a, a totally reductionist view of reality. But Vic, these quantum spiritualists, these quantum theologians, use that evidence even of the last 30 years to say, aha, it proves my point that at the most basic levels of physics, everything is connected and you know, so you hear things about like quantum indeterminacy or something somehow allowing for communication um, li between locations that are light years apart or something because the electrons, you know, electron can move here but also cause an effect light years away or something. Do yeah, you follow yeah, what let, I'm saying? Let me go back to the uh, something you mentioned earlier because it is the key behind all of this, and that is what uh, was called the wave particle. Uh, duality. Yeah. And that was that, this is again early in the 20th century, it was discovered that uh, light was made up of particles called photons. We call them photons. And it was also discovered that. Uh, it was waves. So, so light, which previously thought to be a wave phenomenon, mm -hmm. also turned out to be a particle phenomenon. And then it turned out that particles, things that we were accustomed to thinking of particles, electrons, for example, uh, behave like waves and so and it seemed like it behaved one way or the other depending on what you decide to measure if you decided to measure a particle property like position then you then it was interpreted as a particle and if you uh, decided to measure a wave type property such as a wavelength or frequency then you said the thing was a wave and that was where where that duality came in and it seemed like consciousness we were consciously deciding whether something was a, a particle, whether it was a wave. In fact, a, a famous physicist, uh, John Wheeler, pointed out that you could do, the, do an experiment on a photon from some distant galaxy 13 billion light years away that left there 13 billion years ago, and you can, and you can decide in the laboratory today whether you're going to measure one thing or another. So this idea that you're... you're consciousness is affecting reality not only refers to now currently in the laboratory but 13 billion years in the past 13 billion light years away mm. all over the universe mm -hmm. so here it is conscious your consciousness is supposed to affect everything throughout the universe and that's exactly what these people are teaching if you read what what uh, Chopra and what and, and there's uh, uh, other people that write with him uh, are saying that's what they're saying that we're tuned into this cosmic consciousness uh, that is is all